I'm going to need your help today. You're going to be a very, very important part <clears throat> of this service today. A big part. Through you, we can either lift the anointing of God or we can decrease it. And I believe I'm looking at a room full of born-again, spirit-filled, on-fire people for God. Amen. Believers. Jesus said all things are possible to him that believe. The other side of that pancake is he went into his own hometown. And he said he could do no mighty works because of their unbelief. Now, here's what I'm asking. That you be in faith, believing that today, this church, Encounter Church, is beginning a journey to prepare to live and minister in the power of the Spirit. Now, what I mean by that is, every time we come together on Sunday morning. When you come together in a connect group, you come together in a Bible study, wherever, when we come together, the power of the Holy Spirit is going to manifest in your presence, and people are going to be born again, healed, delivered, and set free. Amen. The book of Ephesians says this, that we may know the exceeding greatness is in power toward thus, us, us who believe according to the working of his mighty, mighty spirit. So if you can get in agreement with me and believe with me and stay with me all through this time, I promised Pastor Joe I'd be through by 1 o'clock. <laughs> stay with me. If you can get in agreement with that, I want you to take the hand of that person next to you as an affirmation of your faith. I'm a believer. I'm in this deal. All right? Now let's pray. Now, Father, in the name of Jesus and by the, his blood, we just come boldly to your throne of grace and favor and mercy. Father, you said where two or more agree is touching anything. It would be. And I'm in a room full of believers right now. So, Father, I'm believing the power of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit will manifest himself. Lives are going to change today. People are going to make a decision today, a decision to put the Word of God first. Father, I thank you for it right now. I thank you right now. The Word's going to go forth. It's going to go forth accurately. Holy Spirit, I release my mind, my tongue to you, all of you, None of me. In the name of Jesus. And everybody said what? Amen. Amen. So it be. If you would, open your Bible to the book of Luke, chapter 3. Now today we're going to begin to and prepare to live and minister in the power of the Spirit. Now Genesis 8.22 says, as long as the earth remains, seed time harvest. Everything comes from seed. You came from seed. Everything comes from seed. It is a spiritual law. If you plant a seed, you water that seed, protect that seed, it will produce. But everything comes from seed. Let me show you. When, when we lay hands on the sick, what we're doing, we're planting seed. The Word of God is seed. And you're planting seed and you plant that seed, then it's up to the person receiving to protect that seed. If that seed's not protected, it won't produce. But there's something else that will keep the seed from producing. Preparation. You have to prepare the ground. A farmer doesn't go out and just throw seed on unprepared ground. You can't go out in this parking lot and throw seed on that ground, it won't produce. You've got to plow the ground. You've got to prepare the ground. And this is the reason that people aren't healed, one of them. Let me, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Why aren't people healed? I will tell you this. 
that the great majority of people that come down to be prayed for to be healed are expecting to be healed instantly. It is not going to happen. Now don't shout me down because I'm preaching good. It's not going to happen. We only have 22 accounts in the New Testament when Jesus healed somebody instantly. Hebrews 10.38 says, how Jesus was anointed the Holy Spirit and power went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil. That word healing means over a period of time. You have to plant a seed and then over a period of time it will produce. You don't go out here and plant a watermelon seed today and look for a crop the next day, do you? And see, we've done a poor job as pastors making people believe, hey, it's going to happen instantly. It can happen instantly, don't get me wrong. But the majority of the time it will not happen. You have to receive that seed of the Word of God, then you have to protect it. You have to water it. Then it will produce. If it was sown on prepared ground. It has to be sown on prepared ground. Everything starts with preparation. Everything. Everything. You don't start uh, college at six years old. You go to school. Everything's preparation. Everything. Now, the other reason that people are not going to be healed is those ministering and those receiving are not prepared. The one ministering may not be prepared. The one receiving may not be prepared. So today, we're going to show you how to prepare to live and minister in the power of the Spirit. Now, have you found Luke chapter 3, verse 21? Luke chapter 3 is the account of when Jesus is about to begin his ministry. John the Baptist is at the River Jordan. He's preaching, repent, be baptized in preparation for the coming of the Messiah. And Jesus goes to the river Jordan, and look at verse 21. When all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus was also baptized. Now, why would the Son of the living God be water baptized? He didn't need to repent. Huh? He was the Messiah. Why did he be water baptized? Jesus said this. He said, I never do anything or say anything unless the Father tells me. So, he was being water baptized on the instructions of the Father. Jesus was in complete submission to the Father's will. Being water baptized was a step of obedience, showing his submission to the will of the Father. He steps into the River Jordan as an act of obedience in preparation for the ministry that's about to begin. And he stands before the people and he says, I am Yeshua HaMashiach. I am the Messiah. He's making a public profession, a public proclamation of who he is. Now, look at verse 20, the rest of it. And while he prayed, the heavens opened. So here he is, he's stepping into the River Jordan, he's being obedient, and when he did, the heavens opened. Listen, I don't know about you, but I want the heavens open and the blessing of God pour out. Now what is water baptism all about today? What's it about? The same thing. It's an act of obedience. It's an act of obedience. In John 14, 15, uh, Jesus said this, he said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And it is a commandment to be water baptized. In Acts chapter 3, he says, be water baptized because of the remission of sin. It's a direct commandment of Jesus. And so when you step into the baptistry to be water baptized, for you, it's a proclamation. You're saying before men, I am born again, Jesus is my Lord, and I'm doing this as an act of obedience. 
And I'm being a witness, a witness to the power of God, and I'm ready to serve. Amen. Now, here's the problem. We've got so many people in churches across this country, people who have been born again, got their fire insurance policy, born again, and will not be water baptized. They're not going to be water baptized. Why? Why? Listen, folks, the world came out of the closet. They came out. They're throwing all their trash and filth at us, and yet the church is staying in the closet. Jesus didn't go out there and sneak around the dark. He came out, man. It's time Christians came out, became witnesses. See, Jesus said this. He said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before the Father. You step into that water baptism tank over there, what are you doing? You're professing before men. I am born again. Jesus is my Lord. He's mine. And I'm submitted to his will. It's time. And you'll never doubt your salvation again if you do it. It's a reminder. You know, Pastor Joe's always saying, Pastor Jay said... So I'm going to do this. Pastor Joe said this. <laughs> He's got a great example. This wedding ring reminds me that I am married to my sweet wife. Hey, where are you back there? Babe, wave your hand. She's way back there in the back where she sits. She's Martha. She's a servant. We're coming up on 59 years. I don't know how she did it. But your wedding ring is a reminder, I'm worried. When you step into that baptistry right there, you can see the water, you can feel the water, and it's a reminder, I'm born again. You will never doubt your salvation again. You need to be water baptized. If you haven't been water baptized, we're going to give you that opportunity today. We need to be water baptized. We need to be a witness. Listen, I am not ashamed of the gospel. I am not ashamed to stand up before people and say, hey, I'm a Christian. I'm not ashamed of it. We need to be witnesses. Let me tell you, witnessing is hard. It's, I understand it's hard. You may tell you a neat way to witness, an easy way to witness. Pray over your food in public. I go into restaurants. I don't see anybody praying. I don't see anybody praying. Helen and I go into a restaurant, we pray. And we don't do it in a little voice. And we order our food, then we pray. We don't wait for the food to get to the table. Now, let me tell you why. I don't know what's going on in that kitchen. <laughs> I don't know who's in there coughing and spitting and everything else on my food. And the Bible says that your food is sanctified by the washing of the Word of God, and no deadly thing will come upon you. Listen, if I'm going to eat that stuff, I'm going to have it sanctified. But we're being a witness. This has actually happened. It hadn't, hadn't happened a lot of times, but it has happened. Recently, we were in Brady, Texas, and we stopped at a restaurant, and we went in and ate, ordered a food, and we prayed, had a good meal. I went up to pay the bill, and the lady said, no, nah, your bill's been paid. Your bill's been paid. Why? Somebody saw we was praying, saw we were being a witness, and went and paid my bill. And that's happened more than once. But let me give you the flip side of that. You know, every pancake's got two sides. This happened several years ago. I was with a group of men, and about six or seven of us, and we went in to eat. We sat down and we ordered. I heard this voice say, you gonna pray? I looked around the table, I thought, well, you know, a group of guys, I didn't do anything. Food came. I heard this small still, but you going to pray. I, no, 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 no. Well, no, no, everybody started already. I, I, I didn't pray. I took the first bite of my food, and I heard this. Coward. <laughs> I did. I heard I thought, I turned to the guy next to me, and I said, you say something? He said, no. I'm talking about down the spirit. You can hear it. I've heard the voice of God. I hear him. 
people say, do you hear the voice of God? Listen, it's not the people that hear the voice of God I worry about, it's the ones that don't. Amen. Took a second bite and I heard, coward, a little bit louder. Oh, I'm in trouble. I went on eight again and I heard it real loud. Coward. Spirit of God speaking to me. He's right. I was a coward. A chicken. I chickened out from praying. Just flat out, cluck, chickened out. When I left that restaurant, I was flapping my wings like a chicken. And I couldn't wait to get to the car as fast as I could to repent. And I'm not going to have that happen again. Now, it's happened, I'll tell you, maybe I've slipped up a couple times. But I'll tell you what, I said, God, it ain't going to happen again. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm a witness anytime I can, and the best way you can witness is pray over your food. Just get in there and say a simple prayer. All you got to do is say, Father, bless this food, and we receive it and thank you for it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Isn't that easy? And you're being a witness, and you're preparing to live and minister in the power of the Spirit. Verse 22, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in a bodily form like a dove upon high. Now this is the, when Jesus was anointed. He was empowered to minister. God never sends you out to do something unless you're empowered. You are a Christian, which means the little anointed one. The little anointed one. But Jesus was anointed, empowered to minister in the power of the Spirit. Now, the anointing is God's power and ability in you and on you doing what your flesh can't do. Your flesh can't heal anybody. It can't deliver anybody. It can't save anybody. All you are is the delivery boy. Your job is nothing but deliver the word of God, that anointed word, and let the word do its work. That's your only job. Up here today, I'm just a delivery boy. I'm just delivering the word. I can't make you hear it. I can't make you act on it. But I sure can deliver it. And Jesus said, let those who have ears to hear, let them hear. Let them hear. I'm believing you're hearing this morning. So he's empowered. Then he's led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness for 40 days, and he prays and fasts. For 40 days, he's praying and fasting. Now, what is fasting about? Fasting does not move God. You do not fast to get God to do something. Fasting does not move God. Fasting is for you to put you in a position to receive. It's preparation. You put aside all this worldly stuff that's out here. You're putting it all aside, turning off the television, turning the phone off, getting along before God, and what you're doing, you're bringing the word forward in preparation to receive. It's for you to receive. And it's been preparing. Now, at the end of 40 days, Satan comes with temptation. Now, the word temptation means a test. Now, the book of James, chapter 1, verse 13, it says, God does not test anyone with evil. John 10, 10 says, the thief came to steal, to kill, and to destroy. If it kills, steals, or destroys, or it's temptation to evil, say this, it is not God. It's not. The church for years has blamed God. Oh, he put that sickness on teaching something. No, he didn't. Sickness and disease and death are an enemy of God. It's an enemy. I hear this at funerals. I just, oh. Well, God took that person. No, he didn't. Thieves take, God receives. He didn't, he didn't take them. You'll receive them. He didn't take them. He didn't do it. Now, Satan comes 
And here's the temptation. It's the same temptation he used on Adam, the same temptation he used on Jesus, the same temptation he uses on you. Are you going to listen to the voice of God and his will? Are you going to submit to Satan and his will? Right? Huh? The Bible says anything out of faith is sin. When you don't act on the word of God, you're in sin. You listen to the voice of a stranger instead of listening to God. And that was the temptation. Now watch this. When Satan came with this temptation, Jesus didn't say, uh, hey, Satan, wait a minute. Hey, Jesus, what, would you reach? I got to find my Bible. Let me, I gotta, listen, I got to find my Bible. I, I, I know it's around here somewhere. I, who? I left it on the River Jordan. I left it on that rock on the bank. I didn't want it to get wet. Uh, can I borrow your cell phone? I need to call Pastor Joe and see if he'll pray for me before this temptation starts. <laughs> he didn't do any of that. He took three little verses out of the book of Deuteronomy. Three little verses. Didn't raise voice. Didn't do it. Just took these three little verses out of the book of Deuteronomy and ran that don't let me call him when I really think he is. <laughs> Ran him off right. with three little verses. Why could he do that? And we can't. Why? Because he was prepared. He had been water baptized, empowered. He had prayed and he had fasted. And he was prepared. Right. And you want to know why we have problems today? It could be we're not prepared. Amen. You know? It could be we're not prepared. Have you ever noticed nobody wants the church praying? They don't want us praying in schools. They don't want us praying at the office. They don't want us praying around the government. They don't want us praying until a hurricane hits Florida. Then we got every politician, TV personalities, oh, we're praying for those people down here. Join us to pray. Uh, I got a suggestion. What if we prayed before? Maybe it wouldn't happen. Maybe we'd be prepared. Hey, just a thought. Just a thought. You know, if this nation prayed, those things might be happening. And you again wonder why we're in a mess? Could be the church didn't pray. Just a, just a thought. Just a thought. But I want you to look what this produced. What did Jesus, being prepared, being water baptized, being empowered, praying and fasting, look at Luke 4, 14. Then Jesus returned in what? The power of the Spirit. Is that not what we're looking for? We're looking for that. We're looking for it. But then he added one other thing. Look down at verse 18. So he came to Nazareth, his hometown, where he'd been brought up, and was his what? Custom. He went to the synagogue on the Sabbath. Jesus was a church goer. Every time the doors opened, he was in church. You know why? He knew by going to church, he would stay prepared. He would stay prepared. Now, you think it's tough listening to me preach. How would you like to be Jesus sitting in the office in the, where you're sitting, and some rabbis up preaching the word of God that he wrote. And I'm sure he was just shaking his head going, where did you get that? <laughs> but he went every time. He was a church goer. Now, remember I said this? Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep your, my commandments. I'm not going to ask for sure hands how many people love him. 
But faith is an action that confirms I believe. Hebrews 10.25, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together, as is the manner of some. I wonder who the some are. Who are the some? Right now, in the United States, we have 92% of the people who believe in God. 20 years ago, we had 69% of the people going to church once a month. Right now, we're at 21%. Hmm. You want to guess who the some are? We only have 7% of the people who make it a custom to go to church regularly. We've got a problem. We've got 93% of the people who must not love Jesus. Sure getting quiet in this Presbyterian church. Don't shout it down now. 93% of the people are the sum. We got 93% of the people who are not prepared. We got 93% of the people scrambling to find his phone number when they're in trouble. It amazes me. Listen, I pastored here for 26 years. I've been in the ministry now a little over 40. I don't know how many times I have seen this. I'm talking hundreds of times where Pastor Joe will minister to people. Somebody will be sick with a, some disease or from something else, some, and the, he will pray and pastor, visit them in the hospital, bring food to their house, minister to them. They get well. Then they disappear and come up with some screwy excuse why I can't be there. Amen. You talk about a lack of integrity and a lack of honesty, that reaches the fall point of it. Now, I'm on my soapbox now because I put up with it for 26 years. I had a person call me one time, want me to come to their house and minister to them because I was their pastor. They hadn't been in church in nine and a half years. They're asking me to take time to do that when I need to be with people who are committed. Amen. I'm preaching good right now. Amen. This, we got to quit playing games, folks. This is important. Right. How am I doing, Pastor? I'm giving up your number, not mine. Hey. <laughs> hey. Hey. It won't do any good. I'm leaving town next week, and I'll be gone for about six weeks. You're not going to find me. <laughs> That's going to keep it. Look at Mark four. I mean, Mark chapter nine. Mark chapter nine. This is the account of when Jesus sent his disciples out to minister to the people. He gave them power and authority over all demons. All means all. And the disciples went out. They began to minister. They were laying hounds on the sick. They're casting out devils. I mean, the game is on. I mean, they're just tearing Satan's kingdom wide open. And then something happened. But suddenly, the anointing lifted. Something happened. And a man came to Jesus with his son. He said, my son is being possessed. The devil's trying to throw him in the fire. He's trying to drown him. He's trying to kill him. I took him to your disciples. They couldn't do anything. They couldn't do anything. Now, Jesus gets given them authority over all demons. And they couldn't cast this devil out. And you can tell by Jesus' response, he is just good old West Texas talk, he's ticked. He is, he's not happy with the disciples. And the man asked him, can you, do, can you do something? Jesus said, bring the boy to me. And he cast the demon out of him. Sets the boy free. And boy, the disciples come running up and they say, Master, Master, why couldn't we do it? And here's his answers in verse 29. This kind only comes out with prayer and fasting. 
Now, was the prayer and fasting part of being prepared? Huh? You know what happened? Disciples go out. Everything's going well. And then suddenly they say, hey, we got this deal. We got it. We, oh, man, we got it. They quit going to the synagogue. They quit praying and fasting. They quit all this and said, man, we got it. They became complacent. They quit being prepared. And they ran up against a demon that they weren't prepared to handle, and there's nothing they could do about it. Right. They started ministering in their own power and their own ability. In the Garden of Eden, God told Adam, you're no longer going to work by faith. You're going to have to earn a living by the sweat of your brow. When you're learning a living by the sweat of your brow, you're doing it in your own power and your own ability. You can have some success for a while. You may have some success doing it in your own power and your own ability, but payday always comes. And there's going to come a time where you're going to run up against something you cannot handle, and you're going to get your brains beat out. It'll happen. And then you want to turn around and run to Pastor Joe, who you haven't seen in the last months. What do I do? What do I do? And I hope he asks you this question. Are you prepared? Were you being prepared? Are you out there just out there being complacent and not doing it in your own power and your own ability? Y'all hearing this? Listen, trials and tribulations are going to come. They're going to come. And you're either going to get backed into a corner and start looking for your Bible and hoping you can find his number. Huh? Right. Or you're going to be prepared and you're going to stand before the storms of life and you're going to look that storm right in the eye and you're going to say in the name of Jesus of Nazareth who I serve, peace! Yeah. You're going to one of the others. One of the others is going to happen. Payday always comes. So my question to you are, are you prepared today? Are you prepared? See, what we're doing, we're treating God like a bellboy. Or let's make a deal. God, let's see, I got water baptized, and I went to church, and man, well, I had this, I had this problem come up on me. And boy, the church ministered to me, and Pastor Joe ministered to me, and we did all these things. And, and I came back to church, and then I thought, well, everything's going all right. See, the hardest th time to, to be a Christian is when everything's going right. That's the hardest time. It's not when times are tough. It's when everything's going right. Well, everything's going good. And then you get complacent, and you just kind of fade away. And you treat God like a bellboy. And here's what I mean by that. God, I got this. Hey, everything's going good. I got it. I got it. I, listen, don't need you. Don't need the church. Don't need anybody. I got this. In my own power and ability. Unless, unless that disaster pops its head back up and God, I've got the bell. Ding, ling, 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 ling. And you better come running. Am I right? And then we play, let's make a deal with him. God, get me out of this. I promise I will get back in church. I double and cross my heart. I do. Get me. I'll get back in church. I'll even go to a connect group. I'll even make the men's Bible study at 6 o'clock. I promise. And God in his mercy gets you out of it. And here you go. Two or three weeks, and then you're right back where you started from because you were not prepared. 9-11. Listen, our church over when we were on the, on the e-way over there held about auditorium, maybe 180 people. I guarantee you after 9-11, that place was standing room only. I had never seen a crowd that big. You gotta understand, in 1990, when this church started, we first Sunday, we only had 47 people. And we probably, if you moved, we probably counted you twice. 
Marilyn was there. Vic and Victy were there. Hollis and Kathy were there. Who am I missing? Few people. That was it. You with me? And then that thing filled up. I thought, glory to God, man. You know, come on. I got a crowd. Well, about two weeks later, I didn't have a crowd. Right back to where we were. And it wasn't because of my preaching either. <laughs> yeah, have been. Can I get an amen? Come on. Amen. Uh, can I get an amen? That's what we're doing to God. It's time, folks. It's time. It's time. You want to live in the power of the Spirit? This is how we're going to do it. We're starting today on the first ground floor. You listen, you don't go to a building wanting to be on the 12th floor and jump to the 12th floor. We're starting on the ground floor today. And Pastor Joe is going to work you up to the 12th floor. Ephesians 5.1 says, be an imitator of God. Really, it means just, hey, copy Jesus. Just copy Jesus. Do what Jesus did. What did he do? What did he do? You realize it took him 30 years to prepare for the ministry? It took him 30 years? It took me 20. Pastor Joe was a fast learner. It only took him about four. That's true. Copy Jesus. Well, what did Jesus do? First of all, you need to be born again. Romans 10, 9 says, if you confess Jesus as Lord, he didn't say Savior, folks. It said what? Lord, Lord Master, who you submit to. See, we're in the body of Christ, didn't submit to him. We're getting a fire insurance policy and going doing our thing. Submit to him. If you love me, you'll keep my what? Uh huh. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is the Lord, believe in your heart that he was resurrected, you will be saved. The word confess means to say the same thing God says. God says he's Lord. So all you got to do is stand up. He's Lord. You're Lord. The next thing you're going to need to do, be water baptized. Be water. Come out of the closet. It's time. Have the courage to stand up. Rick, where are you? 64 years old? Had the courage to get born again at the age of 64 and get water baptized. Right. And I've told him many times, I tip my hat to a man with that much honor and courage right. that he could stand up before people and be water baptized. Amen. You want to be water baptized? Be a witness. Come out of the closet. Be a witness. Set aside some time to pray. I listen. You don't need to go on a 41-day fast. Right now, you couldn't make a two-day. I've gone 21 days. I'm not, listen, it's going to have to be God to make me do that again. <laughs> All you got to do is start small. We're starting small today. Set aside five or ten minutes. Just go to a quiet place, set aside five or ten minutes. Get your Bible out, turn the phone off, turn the TV off. Get off by yourself for five or ten minutes and open that Bible up and just listen to see what God has to say. Hey, I've gone out in the garage in my car to find a quiet place before. Just go find a quiet place. Start small, but be consistent. Be consistent with it. Be consistent with it. And this is how we're going to prepare to walk in the power of the Spirit. Born again, water baptized, empowered, pray fast, and make church a custom. Do not start giving me a bunch of reasons why you can't come to church. Dear Lord, you know what you're doing? Your priorities in life ought to be God, your spouse, your children, you with me? Your work. And then your outside activities and hobbies, Amen. five. The problem is we got a lot of people 
taking their outside activities and hobbies and moving them up to number one. And any time you move something out of order, everything underneath will go crazy. We got people here today that probably knew I was preaching and knew I was going to go to one o'clock and miss the kickoff. <laughs> the Dallas Cowboys are more important to them than the Word of God. And I got a word for them. If the Dallas Cowboys are so important to you, the next time a storm of life comes, pick up the phone and call Jerry Jones and see how that <laughs> gets you. Hmm? See how that works out for you. And Pastor, I hope when they call you, you said, uh, do you need Jerry Jones' number? Is that the reason you call him? <laughs> yeah. Huh? Now Deuteronomy 30, 19, and I'm closing with this. Somebody went, whew. Oh, good night. I got an hour and 15 minutes. <laughs> Deuteronomy 3019 says this, I call heaven and earth together, and I lay before you this day life or death, blessing or cursing. He's giving you a choice. You are where you are today because of the choices that you have made. The choices you have made are why you're standing where you are right now. And when he asked that question, it was an open book test. He gave you the answer. I lay before you this day life or death, blessing, cursing. Therefore, choose life. He's giving me the answer. We're going to give you the opportunity today to make a choice. You can choose life, or you can choose death. And death is separation from God. Or you can choose blessings or you can choose curses. One of the two. Your choice. You're going to have to make a choice. Folks, it's time we stood up and made a choice. Right. Either I'm ashamed of the gospel or I'm not. Jesus said it best. He said in Revelation 3.16, he said this. He said, because you are lukewarm and not hot or cold, I'm going to vomit you out of the mouth. And really what he was saying was this, get in or get out. That's really what he was saying. Get in or get out. Either the word of God is true or it's not. One of the two. Make a choice. Either I believe the word of God is true and I'm going to get in this thing neck deep and be submitted to the lordship of Jesus or get out. You're wasting your time. Go make the Dallas Cowboys your God or whoever. Go ahead. That's what he was telling us. So you've got a choice today. You've got a choice. Choose life. And I'm believing we're going to choose life. I'm going to choose blessing. Amen. Now here's what we're going to do. We're going to prepare to receive. I'm going to show you how to prepare to receive. And I need everybody's help in this auditorium right now. We're going to have people come down here in a few moments. If you don't come down, I need your help. You're going to either increase the anointing or you're going to decrease it. One of the two. You're either going to be involved and increase it, or you're going to shuffle around thinking, how can I get out of here? And you're going to decrease it. I was in a meeting one time with Brother Hagin, powerful man of God, had a tremendous healing anointing. And he had a prayer line set up front. And he, I'm guessing he probably had 150 people on that prayer line. And he's going along, he's laying hands on people. And I mean, the power of God is moving. I mean, but listen, people are being healed. I'm, you, I mean, the, the Spirit of God was so thick in there, it was unreal. And he's going along. And he's got about 30 or 40 people, and he's got a whole mess of people left. And all of a sudden, people start shuffling around, started packing their Bible up, started moving to the door, started all this nonsense, and all of a sudden, he stopped. And he threw his hands up, and he said, 
Folks, that's it. He said, the anointing's gone. He said, there's no use me going on any farther. He said, it won't do any good. It's done. And left about 100 people that needed God. That was it. Because the crowd brought the anointing down. Now, I need your help. And I understand if you need to leave and it's an emergency, fine. But plug in with us. Daniel, where are you? Come on. You did awesome today, son. Amen. A lot of you don't know that he's been going to church here 24 years. Used to lead praise and worship for me every once in a while. Hook in. He's going to leave. Hook in. And you'll increase that anointing. And we're going to begin to see the power of the Spirit flow in this place. Now, we're going to show you how to be prepared. Now, before we get started, I told you, either the one ministering or the one receiving is the big hang-up. This man right here is prepared. He is anointed of God. He's been born again, water baptized. He's been empowered by God. He is anointed to lay hands on the sick. And he has been praying and fasting for this service over the last few weeks. He's ready. Kim Henderson's ready. Prayer team, they're ready. I am anointed of God to lay hands on the sick. I know it. I'm prepared. I've been fasting for the last three weeks. We're ready. And if you'll hook in with us and have the courage to stand up and come down here, you're going to see the power of God manifest in this place like you've never seen it before today. Amen. You're going to see it. Can you believe with me? Amen. I asked before the service, can you believe? Yes. Say, I believe. I believe. I believe. I believe. Now, here's how we're going to prepare. We've got to prepare you to receive. First Corinthians 11.31 says this. Judge yourself, and you will not be judged. We're going to take a moment for you to judge yourself right now, in a moment. Judge yourself. Where have I missed it? Do I need to be water baptized? Do I need to set aside time to pray and fast? Have I been doing this in my own power and ability? Has church been a priority? Judge yourself. Choose life. Judge yourself. And then where well, you've missed it, just use 1 John 1, 9. He said, just confess it, and I'll cleanse you of all unrighteousness. Just admit it and quit it. Put it behind you. Admit it and quit it. Easy, right? The next thing is on Mark <laughs> chapter 11, verse 25, it says, when you stand praying, forgive. Forgiveness is the biggest block that Christians have that will stop the power of God moving in your life. Carrying unforgiveness and grudges. You go ahead and carry those grudges. You may be doing all right, but payday's coming. Get rid of them. Put them behind you. Get up here and say, boy, I tell you what, Pastor Jay was awful hard on me one time. I tell you what, I left church and I didn't come back because of him. Hey, don't look at me that way. I've started three churches in this town by accident. <laughs> look, get up and say, man, I forgive him and bless him. Father, I forgive him and bless him. And the last thing is this, Mark 11, 22 says this, have faith in God. Have faith that if I do my part, God will do his part. God, I judge myself. I'm forgiven. Now, I'm believing you're going to do your part. You're going to do your part. And the moment we ask you to come down here, here's what we're going to do. We're going to prepare. If you need to be born again, I'm going to ask you to step out and come down here. The reason I want you to step out Faith is an action. 
It's impossible to please God without faith. Faith is an action that confirms, I believe. By you stepping 